Welcome to the PBC 2020 NBA Draft Remote Film Room. Joining us today is the Conference USA Defensive Player of the Year and the nation's leader in blocked shots, Osasu Osage. What's going on, Osasu? I'm doing good. How are you guys? Hey, doing pretty well, man. Appreciate you uh, taking the time here during uh, during the quarantine to hop on and you know talk some shop about hoops and about what you bring to the table as a prospect. Okay. Uh, yeah, before we uh, really dive into the tape, uh, I think you're one of the more interesting stories in all of college basketball and kind of, you know, how your career started, kind of like late getting into basketball and how you've really propelled yourself into the spotlight of being a potential NBA prospect and such an elite defensive player. Do you want to maybe, you know, just share your story of how you got from, you know, where you were in high school to where you are now? Uh, yeah, so I started basketball pretty late. You know, I started when I was about 16 or so. Um, I played one year um, high school basketball at JV. You know, I stopped playing. I pretty much sat out a year, and then I came back my senior year, but I didn't really get the looks I was looking for. You know, I did AAU for one year. It wasn't really uh, something that worked for me. And then pretty much my senior year of high school, going into college, I just decided that I wanted to really get in shape and really, like, take basketball serious and, you know, I walked on at FIU, uh, and then for my first two years under a previous coach, um, I was a walk-on. And then my junior and senior year when Coach Jeremy Ballard came in, he offered me the chance to get a scholarship. Yeah, that's awesome, man, that you were able to, you know, really focus in and then put yourself in a situation to, you know, once the cards all fell and aligned how they were supposed to, that you were able to take off and really, you know, bring – all your strengths to the table and become such an impactful player. So I think that, you know, with you kind of getting a late start there and being on this really high level development curve, I think that's encouraging for like, once you now get into a pro system that that development could continue to even accelerate more at an exponential rate. So I'm sure that uh, teams are excited about that. I agree. Definitely. So let's, uh, Without further ado, let's hop into some of your game film here and uh, talk through some of the strengths that you bring to the table that will translate cleanly and maybe a couple minor areas to improve on as you begin your career as a pro. Okay. All right. So we're going to start with some strengths on the offensive end. And uh, as you know, the NBA is a very pick and roll heavy league. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that you've shown a lot of development in your comfortability as a, you know, a pick and roll screener and a roll man to the rim. Uh, you're ve I feel like you're very uh, assertive and purposeful in the screens you're setting and then diving straight to the rim and uh, giving your point guard a good angle uh, to hit you for these dunks. So let's start with this first clip here. You come set this pick, dive right to the rim, get the easy bucket, but let's run that back and really kind of go through the granular details of this thing, right? So you come here and set this screen for your guard to drive to the middle. You see your big hedging. What What's going through your mind right here at this point in time as soon as you start rolling? Um, I see the big hedging, so I know if I get to the basket, um, well, whoever's going to tag me from them corners, either somebody's going to get a three, a wide open three, and we yeah. have two knockdown shooters in the corner. Um, or if, you know, if they do feed it to me and there's somebody tagging me, you know, I have a, a huge size advantage and I just got to go up strong and finish. Yeah. And is that something that I guess is your, uh, I mean, I can let this run now, but as you're sort of preparing for a given opponent, uh, is your team going through the film and your coaches, are they prepping you for like what to expect on, you know, those taggers and like what the other team's tendencies are like in defending the pick and roll? Yeah, we do a lot of time watching film on Tennessee. Western Kentucky actually surprised us a little bit with how their defensive coverage was. Um, yeah. So it was a lot of opportunities at the rim. Yeah, because it seems like, uh, you know, the guy that you assumed might be tagging from the corner ends up just kind of stunting a little mm -hmm. bit and then exactly. pops back out to defend the three and ends up giving you a wide open lane here when it's all said and done. Exactly. So I'm sure when that's happening that your eyes are lighting up like, okay, it's time <laughs> for me to feast here. Definitely. All right, next one here is against Charlotte. This time you don't even actually set the screen, right? Like you come up, you're about to set it, and then you just end up slipping through. 
Is yeah. that again something like from your film study, or you just recognizing it in the moment that like this is how this coverage is likely to play out, and maybe seeing a little space back here near the restricted area for you to just dive? Uh, it's a little bit of both. I mean, when I'm sending a screen, my biggest thing is I just want to get that angle, basically yeah. on like a third of his body. And once I see, you know, my point guard start going off and he's going over the top, I know that the space is there and the angle's opened up. Yeah, and then this paint is wide open here. Wide open. Yeah. You know, with both these guys pinching so hard up here, you put this guy in a pretty tough situation where, you know, if he does dive with you, like you were saying, you have the size advantage. But if, you know... And also, if he dies with you, this whole side is open for your shooter over here, right? So I think, you know, I think that you as such an overwhelming presence in setting these pick and rolls, it's going to provide a lot of rim gravity, even at the next level, to kind of shrink the court for the defense and mm -hmm. leave a lot of space for your uh, teammates once they eventually do start tagging you and cutting you off here, which provides a lot of value. I agree. Next one. Set another uh, screen here, and I like how this one, you're able to rise up, have good timing. It's a nice pass from your point guard, but you kind of are able to, you know, fight through that help side defense coming, rise above them, snag that, and put it through. Uh, have you worked a lot on, I mean, something that I think that I've seen in the tape is that your hands have gotten a lot better, mm -hmm. and your sort of timing on these, on these plays has gotten a lot better with your... Uh, Kind of your chemistry with your pick and roll handler and like timing out when to jump and uh your finishing so is that something that just as you've gotten a lot more reps that you've gotten more comfortable with yeah it's something i struggle with first, but um, these are kind of like second nature these these actions are stuff that we go over on a day-to-day -day basis every day in practice yeah and once once you do it enough i'm sure that you know the timing of when you start start your gather right here becomes second nature and you know you know that you're much bigger than this guy under the rim that you can rise up and be un unaffected by him and still finish on the play so i think you've gotten much better at that even from your junior to your senior year and uh you know i think if you just keep continue working on that that you'll be a really nice lob threat at the next level thank you thank you <clears throat> Next clip here, one more. I like this one because the pass was a little bit behind you mm -hmm. and you were able to sort of adjust in midair and still make that catch and finish fluidly. And, you know, the passes aren't always going to be perfect to you from uh, the pick and roll handler. And I liked that, uh, that adjustment in that moment. This one, you sort of switch sides where you're setting the pick and uh, the defense actually crashes down on you quite a bit on this one, as opposed to some of these others where you had more space to operate, mm -hmm. but you're still able to get up there, kind of take some contact and have nice touch in there to finish inside. So it's not always just dunks being able to have that little floater package and finish, you know, over some high hand contests in the paint. That's going to be huge for you as well. Mm -hmm. Now I wanted to quickly, before we move on to um, some other stuff, I think one of your potential areas of upside offensively is your jump shooting uh, getting much better uh, over the course of your career. Mm -hmm. um, so th we're just going to go through a couple clips here where you really step in confidently to a three pointer here. Just no real hesitation, pretty good looking stroke. Mm -hmm. I imagine that wasn't really something that was part of your game, like in high school and even early into college when you first walked on, but maybe you know, when that coaching change happened and you became more of a full-time starter and got more minutes, that did that kind of propel your confidence forward to be willing to take these shots? And did you also work on these a lot more in practice and get more comfortable and pulling up? Yeah, um, a little bit of both. Um, You know, we, Coach Ballard, um, he encourages me to take that shot, actually. And, you know, we get a lot of reps up. I probably, before this moment, I've probably taken, before my senior year, I probably didn't take more than, you know, three threes in my entire basketball career in the game yeah yeah and that's that's good because you know in the modern nba everyone wants a big that is at least a threat to shoot right like it's not like you have to be one of these guys that's chucking up six threes a game or something right but like to be able to have you know some spot up 
ability and maybe even throw a pick and pop in there every once in a while, I think adds so much incremental value. Um, and I think that that's somewhere that you could continue to grow because, you know, I, I think that the form looks pretty good and you were about a 70% free throw shooter this year, which is a good indicator of, you know, some shooting potential for someone of your size. So mm. it's really like, you know, I know that these were limited, not like a ton of attempts or anything, but I like the confidence and I like that you now have some willingness to put these up and are at least a threat from deep. Yeah. And that's definitely valuable at the professional level. Thank you. Are you excited for, uh, are you excited for the, um, you know, the next level where the spacing is a little bit more, uh, more favorable for you like everything's a little wider out you have more room to operate and yeah uh, yeah i like, I, like I, like, um, I watch a lot of nba basketball and just basketball in general and just like the spacing having more space and room to operate the system and how people like teams play a lot of ball screen i think it just works hand in hand with how i like to play yeah i think that's gonna be a seamless fit for you and give you a lot more room as the role man and then you know, even when people tag on you, it gives you a lot more space to kind of like kick out as a short role playmaker and kick it back out to the corner. I think it's just going to open things up for you. And if you're able to space the floor, like we were just looking at in those clips, then all the better. Yeah. So we're going to go over just a couple potential like improvement areas offensively now. And mm -hmm. one thing that I noticed in going through the film was sometimes whether it's on an offensive rebound or you get fed in the post, you tend to favor, you know, sometimes you put the ball on the floor when you don't need to, right? Mm -hmm. Especially on these putbacks, you want to probably just keep it high and go right back up as opposed to bringing it down and giving those guards a chance to dig in or giving the bigs a chance to kind of like reposition. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you seem to want to like get back to your right hand when maybe you could have just went straight up on the left side. Yeah, so we're yeah. just going to let these ones run here real quick. I like how much you fight to get this offensive rebound. And if you look here, it seems that, you know, you have a decent little angle here to just go kind of straight up here on the left side yeah. and just go through, but end up putting it on the floor. You still try to go to your left to your credit, but I think if you just maybe avoided even taking that dribble and just went straight up powerful with it, that you could avoid, uh, you know, that guy being able to recover and get a hand on it. Yeah. This next one here, again, love how you fight for this offensive rebound, put it on the floor again, and then that gives that guy some time to sort of dig down and crash on you and get a hand. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something that, I guess, when you're grabbing an offensive board, do you just feel more comfortable sometimes putting it on the deck once to get yourself to gather, or is that something that you're trying to sort of like eliminate from your game as much as possible? Um, it's not something I've really noticed in actuality. It's more of if I don't feel like I'm on balance, I kind of just do that to gather myself and go up. Yeah. I just want to make sure I go up strong. That's my biggest thing. Yeah. And sometimes the situation will call for it and that's totally fine. But, you know, sometimes you might be better served to just like keep it high and just try to go straight up from there. And that might be able to help you in these sort of situations. Okay. Uh, just one last play here. You catch it, you bring it to the middle and just, uh, you know, you're you're like kind of fading back a little bit on that one. Again, not not an awful play here because I, I think that the dribble actually does help get you through these two guys and create some space. So I kind of like that. But mm -hmm. maybe like as opposed to fading away and trying to put that thing up, like just get up into them, take some contact, get the stripe where you're a seventy percent free throw shooter. Okay. Do you think that maybe like trying to use your physicality to? Uh, get to the line more often could be a good way for you to, you know, uh, accumulate some points efficiently at the next level. No, definitely. I think uh, getting into somebody's chest and, you know, eliminating a shot blocker strengths, uh, I think that'd be great. And it's easy opportunities at the line, you know. Yeah. H have you uh, put a lot of work into like strength and conditioning and putting on muscle uh, at the college level? And is that something that you think as you proceed forward into being a full time pro and like, you know, you don't have school anymore and you have a, you know, a strength coach full time, like working with you. Is that something you think could really like open things up for you as like a rebounder and as a putback threat and as a physical force? 
Yeah, definitely. I think I'm somebody who like takes a lot of pride in treating his body like a temple as best as I can, and you know, really being cautious about what I put in my body. And I think there's, I think I, this can like it can take me to a whole new level if I really lock in and you know, elevate my my game and my body together. Yeah, and it seems like you do a good job of that now. And you know, as you get a little older, you get into like your mid twenties. I think there's potential for you to. You, add to your frame, get stronger, and that'll definitely help you in a few different factors of your game, and you can continue to grow that way. Now we're going to hop over to the defensive side where we both know is your particular area where you add the most value and is immediately, I think, the most translatable area of your game and being a rim protector, right? So before we even dive into these clips, can you want to maybe just tell me Firstly, do you know what your wingspan is offhand? I actually don't. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask me that, and yeah. I've never got it measured. Well, we're going to have to get that measurement. I'm going to circle back with you and uh, make sure that I get that because I'm I'm really interested uh, to see what the tape says, but it sure appears to be uh, well over seven feet. But um, not only just having the wingspan, though, but you have those instincts as both an on-ball defender when someone's trying to post you up or drive on you and as an off ball defender in a team construct where you know you're that weak side rim protector that when a, one of your teammates get, gets beat you kind of get to the spot get up there and contest and either block the shot or force up a really tough look yeah. is that something that has come naturally to you and be able being able to kind of make those rotations and read what's happening with uh, the rest of your teammates or is that something that Again, as you've gotten more reps, you've gotten a better feel for. Um, I think it's more natural. I think it's kind of just instincts and, you know, me just surveying the floor and seeing where I think it's an opportunity for me to help. And if I have an opportunity to, you know, chase back block or something like that. I think it's, yeah. 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 And I, I mean, you averaged, what, 3.7 blocks per game, almost uh, 14 block percentage, which is pretty unheard of. Like, those are ridiculous stats. Mm-hmm. And, I think, you know, what's also encouraging is that some of them came against high level competition too, like, like high majors. It's not like all in conference or all against, you know, low major teams, mid major teams, you've done it consistently, no matter who you're matched up against. So let's dive into some of this film here and see what you bring to the table as a shot blocker. This one, you're off, you're on ball. And I like, the physicality on this one, right? So this guy gets the ball at the top of the key, thinks he has you in an ISO, maybe that he'll be able to break you down and take you off the bounce or something, right? Mm-hmm. Do you do you kind of like get excited when someone thinks that they might have some sort of advantage on you and you have this feeling that you're just going to eat their shot up uh, if they go mm-hmm. at you? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like that. I mean, I look at it and I kind of I can always gauge kind of when I'm about to get a block or if I don't get a block, maybe change somebody's shot tremendously. So it is kind of like it's almost funny almost. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you can tell you're kind of eyeing them up, like getting ready for him to come at you. Yeah. He does. He tries to. And I bet you a lot of drivers try to do this to you. Right. Like they try to get that forearm into you to yeah. create some space to get that shot off. Right. Yeah. I got a couple of injuries like that. Yeah, exactly. And you, I'm sure you got all bruised up from it, but, uh, you know, this guy's really trying to extend that arm, but I like how you're able to take that physicality. He tries to bump you off, but you recover right back straight into your jump, right? You spring right up into it, go straight up, perfect timing on the block off the backboard, keep it in bounds. And that, you know, they ultimately get the ball back just because of a weird bounce, but that's just great rim protection in an isolation situation right there. Mm-hmm. This next one, your opponent has a little bit of a secondary break, slow it down. Again, this guy thinks, okay, I've got Osasu out here on the wing. Maybe his feet aren't quick enough to stay in front of me, but uh, I think a, he underestimates, you know, you have pretty quick feet for your size, right. And you're able to, stick with some of these guys, but B, you also have that recovery length with the crazy wingspan that we were talking about. So he starts driving middle on you here. Uh, Do you want to maybe talk through, like, I guess when you see someone drive into the middle and you're out on the wing, what's your first instinct? Are you like trying to 
you know, sprint straight toward the restricted area and time up your block? Or are you trying to slide and get in front of them first? Like what's your instinct as like such a prominent shot blocker in this situation? Uh, for a situation like that, kinda, you know, I started off in a bad stance and I know I'm beat. I'm kind of actually trying to allow them to believe that they have a shot. So I kind of want to yeah. ease off on them and give them a little bit of space and then recover. So Right. So it's like you're sort of, like you're saying, you get kind of beat here, but then you're like, okay, let me bait him into it at this point. Like, exactly. Exactly. like let him think he's going to get a clean look. And then, you know, you have that uh, recovery window to get there and block it. Exactly. Uh, also, any commentary on the wacky inflatable arm flailing tube man back here in the back? Like, what's up with that? That's your home. What's that thing doing back there? That's above my pay grade. I don't know why that's there. <laughs> I, I just noticed that in a few of these clips, and I'm like, what in the world is going on with that? Uh, okay, so let's move on to this next one here. So you're fighting in the post right now, right? This guy's trying to relocate, get some position and tr almost trying to draw you away from the driving lane, but you seem to recognize, okay, my wing defender, it become on this weak side here, it becomes his job to sort of slide in and kind of seal off my man from a dump off pass and I can open up and help on this driving lane. Uh, is you wanna maybe speak to, you know, is that kind of what's going through your mind right here or what's your read in this situation? Yeah, in my kind of just help and I expect him to rotate. I mean, of course, there's a lot of breakdowns defensively at times, but I'm going, I think um, DA, my teammate, I think he's beat. So I'm just trying to help him. And then I just have to hope and trust that uh, my teammate is going to have my back. Yeah. And I think you do a nice job. You open up your hips here and then, you know, take one little slide into the restricted area, are ready to go up off two feet. And I like your timing is just so good because, like, this guy's dealing with some, you know, a contest from your teammate. It's kind of like hanging up there in the air for a little bit. And you are, you have the patience to sort of wait and time it out for like when he's about to release it. And then you pop up and just send it to the corner and get a fast break going there. Uh, this one, I particularly wanted to highlight this one because uh, you're going up against Minnesota, who has Daniel Oturu, who's one of the, uh, more productive bigs in the country this year is getting some uh, looks as like a late first round, early second round type guy in this draft. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll just let this clip roll and see. He tries to uh, face up and attack you off the bounce from the top here. Drives to the right, tries to, you know, put up a tough little floater here and you're able to get up there, get your hand slightly on the ball, deflect it and, you know, kind of force him away from like taking an actual powerful drive to the rim, getting into the paint and getting up. You force him to flail up a really tough look off balance because he knows you're such a good rim protector. Mm -hmm. And even in doing so, he's not able to get off a clean look. So you, uh, I guess when you get these opportunities, when you're matched up against a guy who you know is like one of the better bigs in the country, does that like get you even more fired up to kind of, be able to show out against somebody that has that kind of rep? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I love people, uh, proving people wrong. And when I'm matched up against somebody like that or when we played, I think, Mississippi State or NC State, I just yeah. see the opportunity to impress and surprise a lot of people. Yeah, and I think that that's a good attitude to have, you know, as you proceed forward into the pros, then you're going to be facing guys like this all the time and mm -hmm. sort of – taking that pride and knowing that you have a little bit of this underdog story and these guys are, you know, have been highly touted for a long time and you have that ability to show out and defend them in these situations is great. And having that sort of willpower and, um, you know, again, back to how you said that your willingness to work and keep putting in those reps, I think that you'll be able to hang with all these guys on the defensive end uh, okay. as you move forward. Last clip here on the defensive end. I like how this time you're just really patient, right? Like, you know, there's no reason for me to leave my feet here. Let me just keep sliding with them. No reason for me to like really hand check or anything. You keep your arms out like this so they don't call a foul on the drive. He tries to pump fake you and kind of go up and under on you. And you maintain that strong stance right there and time it out for the nice block. Just mm -hmm. Thought that was really well done. Thank you. So everyone knows that 
you are such a strong rim protector. But I think, you know, maybe where a question comes to light is, you know, how can you defend in space in, you know, switch situations or with a more perimeter oriented player that you're matched up against? And we did show earlier how sometimes in face ups, you do a great job of moving your feet, baiting guys into blocking them. But I think sometimes when you're faced up against maybe a more prominent shooting threat, that your closeouts can get a little bit a uh, little bit wild out on the perimeter and you can yeah. tend to jump on those a little bit more than you probably would like to. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of those, but before we even get into it, you want to maybe speak to like, I guess, is that something that you've noticed in your film as well and your tendencies that I know you love blocking shots, like that gets your team's momentum going. You thrive at that, but maybe sometimes out on the perimeter, uh, you get a little – too anxious to try to block a jump shot attempt. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. Me and my coaches like we talked about it a lot. And then just understanding closeout players and what they want to get to and stuff like that. And I think at times I get a little jittery. I get a little excited yeah. and like anxious to block the shot, like you said. And that's just something that I just I've been working on and I'm trying to eliminate from my game. Yeah. And I think that you, you know, with the length that you bring to the table, like even if you don't actually jump on a closeout, I think that length is enough to alter the shot and you don't really even need to leave your feet, right? If you just get out there and kind of break down and get that arm up, that in and of itself will be enough to alter the shot and make it a tough look, right? So you see here, this guy's out pretty deep and he, I mean, he might be a good shooter, right? But he's out at easily NBA range there, starts you know, lining up for his shot and you leave your feet on this closeout, he gets to the rim for the easy bucket. So that's like a particular instance where maybe you just, you know what, you get your hand up, make it tough, and maybe you live with it if he sinks one of those. But yeah. uh, just keeping your feet on the ground would be best served in that situation, I think. Yeah. This one here, you're matched up against a stretch big. Um, looks like he's going to get a clean look here and you end up flying out past him. He gives you the one pump. He ends up missing the shot, but sends you flying out past him. Uh, just another instance where maybe like just kind of break down, chop your feet, get a hand up, and then, you know, see what happens and try to just stay disciplined in that situation, right? Okay. You have, you have any thoughts on that? No, I agree. I think in scramble moments such as that, like it's just sticking to the discipline and your principles of defense. And, you know, like you said, I got to chop my feet. Yeah, because I like, you know, I like that you were helping, right? Like you were helping, you know, because you thought maybe this guy might beat him baseline. Your instincts are to kind of come here and cut that off. And then, you know, he make makes a kind of odd play there. Ball goes on the ground, scrambling situation. I mean, that's my natural instinct too when I see that happening is to run out there and try to run and jump and get a get a hand. But you can just use that length and deter it without even jumping, I think. Okay. Only one more of these. Uh, another one where they rotated around a little bit. Everyone's in scramble mode, and you end up uh, flying past the shooter on this one again. Hmm. Uh, just, just the same sort of thing, just highlighting that, you know, maybe just take your time, make sure you maintain that disciplined stance and you can use your length to your advantage to not get yourself in those tough situations there. Okay. Appreciate it. Yep. Uh, so that's it for the game film there. And, you know, when it's all said and done, I think that you're going to be able to immediately, whether it's, you know, whether it's the G league, whether it's uh, like on a, two-way contract going up and forth between G League and NBA or overseas or at Summer League, wherever your immediate beginning of your career takes you, I think that your immediate plug-and-play value is going to be on the defensive end, blocking shots, protecting the rim. And I think that's obviously immediately translatable. I think it's encouraging that you've improved as a free throw shooter and shown some willingness to stretch it out a little bit on offense as a complement to your rim gravity and diving to the rim. And then if you can just brush up a few minor things on the perimeter and your closeouts and whatnot, I think that, you know, you're going to be a really nice, well-rounded young player as you be begin your career with a lot of potential to grow and improve going forward. Thank you so much. So before we get going here, uh, 
in light of the uncertainty surrounding this pre-draft process, normally when you would come out now, you would be arranging to go work out with teams, right? And you'd be in that intimate environment, be able to, you know, shake hands with front office people, be able to work out in front of them and coaches and kind of uh, prove yourself up against some other potential draft candidates and, you know, show what you bring to the table in that kind of setting. But uh, with the COVID-19 situation, the pre-draft process is in flux and you don't really get that normal opportunity. So Mm -hmm. we want to give you the stage to kind of express to NBA teams what you bring to the table. So who is Osasu Osage? And if a team were to bring you into their organization, what could they expect from you both on and off the court? Um, In terms of on the court, they can expect a hard worker, somebody who's diligent and very determined uh, to be successful and really a keen learner, uh, somebody who takes a lot of pride on the defensive end. Um, And um, off the court, um, I think I'm somebody who I kind of believe that good things come to good people. It's something I've tried to, you know, model my life around and just do good by people um, and do the best I can, honestly. Yeah, and that's a great attitude to maintain as you, you know, make this transition from college to the pros. And, you know, I think if NBA teams know that that's what they're getting, that they should be excited about that. So, Osasu, thank you very much for joining. Appreciate the time. Uh, Definitely going to be uh, monitoring your career as you get everything started here. Excited for what's to come for you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.